No, I will really. I'm going to appoint more game scouts and I'll wipe them out. Wipe them out. Those people saying things are wonderful in Zimbabwe, they don't know. They need to have their heads red. Africa. Africa is for the animal. I don't know who the animal is, but they are the animal. I counted on one occasion 113 eland going over a fence. You will not find one eland on this property anymore. There is no game left. It's all gone. You're lucky to see a bird. The last, uh, eland. The last eland I saw on my farm had seven dogs chasing it. Seven. Fortunately, I could shoot five of them. All these snares have been removed from this farm in only the last few days. The irony is that it used to be game fencing, supposed to protect the animals. More than 60 kilometers of game fence have been stolen just on this farm. And once they're on the property, they start stripping all sorts of things. This metal rod used to be part of a water pump on a borehole. The pump is long gone, and the rod has been turned into a spear for hunting. This is a giraffe's leg, and here you can see how the snares do their work. Just two years ago, there were 135 giraffes on this ranch. Today, there are probably less than 10 left. All these horns have been collected in the felt in the last day or so. This giraffe's head is still fresh. Out of 12,500 head of game in this area last December, 9,500 have been poached. My story is about the animals and humans on the receiving end of President Robert Mugabe's land reform policy, and in particular about one such man, a farm manager, Cornelius Skreer, 75 years of age, and living totally on his own on a cattle and game run. But it could just as easily have been the story of any of his neighbors. Cornelius meets me on the Zimbabwean side of the Bitebridge border post with South Africa. He has also just heard that the local filling station has diesel in stock and they let him buy 200 liters. Not enough, but it will help. His employer is also a South African who offered one of his three farms to the government for resettlement in an attempt to save the other two. The plan didn't work. On paper, he is still the owner, but that's about as far as it goes. The farms have been taken over by so-called A1 and A2 settlers. The government said each settler could claim a plot of between 20 and 50 hectares. In this arid environment, it's just about big enough to run two head of cattle. And then he must also clear eight hectares of it to plant, even though he doesn't have implements and 35 years rainfall figures show that it is impossible to farm with maize here. You can see how the fence has gone here. It's been stolen. I'll also show you some other places tomorrow so that you can see how things are going here. It's terrible. We can't go on like this. The game has been driven off by dogs in packs of five or six, chasing the game until they catch them. Then they come and they kill them with spears. The face of famine caused by many more humans and animals than these parts can carry. The Grain Marketing Board brought some maize this morning to feed the black community because of the famine. They don't have a place. The truck was supposed to have gone to the school at Valcom, but the roads are impossible. So they asked if they could offload it here at my house. The people you see walking here now each got to buy one bag of maize today. That night, I don't sleep well. And at five the next morning, Cornelius wakes me. It is the two weekly farmers meeting today, and my camera has to go with. After coffee, I have a quick look around the house and outbuildings. On this side of the fence are Cornelius's laborers. And on the other side are the settlers waiting for more maize to be delivered. 
In the meantime, they'll just stay here, and this creates a security problem. These snares all come from this farm over the last few days. These legs are from a zebra that's been caught in a snare. That's where the snare was. You can see how the foot got swollen and then rotted. And that's these carcass they're cutting up. Fresh carcasses found in snares are brought to the house for meat for the laborers. And now to see a few of the kraals on the farm. This one, right next to the house, I dubbed cripple kraal, because the animals here all have one thing in common. You see where the skin is black. The blood circulation was cut off. The foot rotted and the whole hoof fell off. This is typical of how a wire snare abuses an animal. Jan, this animal also got caught in a snare on a left hind leg. You can clearly see the scar of the snare, but the laborers found her rather quickly. They normally make a hell of a noise when they caught. Then the laborers, who now all have pliers with them, run and cut them loose. So that's why she didn't lose the whole foot, but only part of the hoof. You see, Johan, with a foot like this, even if she picks up weight, she won't be able to carry a bull. The next one I dubbed veggie crawl. The person who settled here sells vegetables and runs a mill for the others. And now he's got a garden. There is the engine pulling water from the dam for his garden, and we can't allow it. But if he brings his own diesel for water for his animals here at our pump, I don't have a problem. But now he steals our diesel to water his plants and run the mill. And then locked crawl. So these aren't your cattle? No, it's the cattle from the Blacks at Valcom, who want to drink here. Ours are inside the kraal. Valcom is one of the other two farms. The boreholes there have been destroyed. The settlers don't have diesel and the animals are thirsty. The water table is too deep for a hand pump. And even a mono only delivers about 800 liters per hour, which again is heavy on diesel. And even if he wants to help, Cornelius doesn't have enough diesel even for his own animals. Excuse me for walking away, but I have to let my calves get out to their grazing. Locked crawl is a time bomb kitchen. You see, Johan, I don't have another option but to lock these black cattle out. We can't pump water for everyone. If they bring diesel, I'm prepared to open the gate and let their cattle drink. En route to the meeting, we stop off at another place where Cornelius' employer rents grazing. The cattle here are also having a hard time. Jan, I have to take 35 head of cattle out here and send them to the abattoir. But because of the drought, I can see I won't find 35 yet. I'll have to go and look at the herd, but I just want to put them through here to have a proper look. But at least he can walk. One more destined for cripple crawl. This is what you get from wire snares that day. Jan, if these calves don't get help soon, they all die. In the competition for grazing and water, it is the game who lose first. Jan, you can see the wire is broken here. The hanger is off. Here is the wire. The young Elon cow tried to jump the fence. She's so weak she couldn't get up again. She just died here. I feel so sorry for these animals, just dying of hunger like this. Here we are at the young giraffe, he died of hunger. He died because he is small, and the leaves they feed on are finished. The main aim of the meeting is to support one another. Although many are too afraid to talk on camera, a few are prepared to tell their stories. And everyone has the same theme, suffering, destruction and financial imprisonment. Those who could have left long ago. Buxverjun owns a big cattle and game ranch next to Gonara specializing in overseas hunters. No one comes here anymore.
viable card, my nose. We had lots of game, but now, Nyalas, Kelam, Zebra, you name it, it's all gone. Johan, of the Oomlik. Johan, at the moment, we don't have. For Andre Fury, life also isn't easy. You know, any Mupani tree, thicker than four inches, doesn't get chopped down. It's burnt down. They axe it at the bottom, then they make a fire inside it. And if it's a big tree, it could burn for two or three days before falling over. And then it doesn't stop there. The whole tree is burnt. In two weeks' time, it's still smoldered. Then the whole tree is just ashes. There are thousands and thousands of tons of wood, and this is a hardwood area that's just been burnt away. There's no sense of maybe we'll need it tomorrow. Everything has been changed into ashes. It's not nice to witness such destruction. Not nice at all. We have nothing left at all today. I, I personally think that uh, the, flood, the flooding of the people onto the farms has been put there just to totally destroy those farms. These people are being used as stormtroopers. Um, they are being used, called war veterans, but really they are insulting the true war veterans. I do not believe that even the true war veterans will do as these people are doing now. They are being told to destroy everything that is um, perceived to be white or wealth um, just as a political action to get rid of us. It's a form of ethnic, ethnic cleansing. Um, they, they actually want all what they perceive as the old colonials out of the country, whether we're first, second, third or fourth generations of Barbians or what, we are still perceived as colonialists and they want to get rid of us, which is very unfortunate because we do believe that we as Zimbabweans have a lot to offer this, this country. Mike is also a farmer who has lost just about everything but his house. But for the past years, he has also been a spokesperson for the commercial farmers around here. And maybe he has a better idea of the bigger picture. How could a country or a government in an attempt to hold on to power destroy his own economy, his own country, basically? I mean, in the end, what will he have left to rule with? Well, it's strange that it, it was even reported that um, a government permanent secretary um, stood up and said exactly that, so I quote, even if we have to bring the country to its knees and destroy it totally, uh, we will do it to achieve our objective. It is just part of their strategy, which is Marxist. Um, Pol Pot did the same. Uh, once, once you destroy the whole economy of the country, everybody goes on their knees and they have to beg for their food, they have to beg for everything. One just has to look at the fuel queues we've got now, the maize queues, the bread queues, the sugar queues, the cooking oil queues, everything is, a, is just one big queue. Um, and this is bringing people down to a level where they have to uh, submit to the will of the political party and if they are going to um, be fed anything at all. This is another one of our bulls that was caught in a snare. A double steel wire snare. Obviously, they're trying to catch kudus and big game with it. The animal struggled here around the trees. He broke this bush as he tried to break free, but eventually he wound himself around that tree twice, and that is what killed him. It's the 47th head of cattle we have lost since last November. Today, Ron and his wife are going back to their ranch. They were kicked off for the second time two weeks ago and have taken refuge in a neighbor's outbuilding. I've been fortunate to have this place to put my 
two belongings. The police arrived um, with the district administrator and a follow-up vehicle with some police or whoever they were and said to me, you've got two hours to move. Kupi suffers from the same stress as everyone else around here. I am frightened to go home. We've had our gates smashed down uh, numerous times um, with screaming people with axes. I don't like what I see because it's ethnic cleansing to me. I have taken pictures of some of our cattle that were axed. While they're alive, the spines are completely chopped off and their tails, and they are left here to die. Our horses have been killed. Out of 17 horses, we've got five left. They've killed most of our horses. If they chop down the trees, they know that they're affecting you. They know it affects you. We were lying in bed at night, and they would chop trees right near our security fence. Right through the night. The, the chopping would go on right through the night. And you cannot sleep, because every tree meant something to me. Every tree. And they did it just to get at us. I loved the trees, I loved, I loved the wildlife, I loved everything, but now I don't want to go home. There's no future. At their house, everything seems intact, but no one knows how long they'll be allowed to stay this time round. Court orders don't necessarily carry any weight around here. Not good. I promise you, not good at all. It looks terrible. I actually don't even want to unpack anything because we don't know what's going to happen. Does it seem to be any damage since you've been gone? No, not here. And in terms of the animals, any more damage? Well, no, not particularly apart from one busy dying on the lawn that we've been trying to feed. What's wrong with the calf? Well, she can't calve, you know. It's just let me come in here, just pull a gate down, huh? I'll come in with a man down. This heifer was too small to take a bull. Now she can't calf. The laborers have been struggling for hours, and Ron is getting desperate. You see all the squatters? Cattle came in here. We had no control of our, our bullying. We've had huge bulls go on to undersized heifers, and this is the sort of problem you land up with. We'd have to put it down after the measure. It is almost as if something inside Ron also broke, and he decides to show me what is left of his life's work. It is not a pretty sight. This is one of our, one of our watering points that we're just approaching now. We've had, the, there's no pipes anymore, no water. Have a look at the house. They wanted the door. They stripped the whole door, window frame, everything out of the house. But I haven't been able to, I haven't been able to repair it. I can't repair it. I've got no water coming here. They put their hut all along the original pipeline, hoping to be able to tap into the, into the water supply. But then they've gone and ploughed their fields and they've ploughed the pipes up and somebody was a bit dirty, so they just broke a plastic pipe. So we've had to cl close down the whole water system. There's nothing left. We invested every cent we've ever made here into the property. If we walk out, we walk out penniless. We haven't even been offered anything for the farm. With losing the EU market, there's no cattle. You can't sell cattle. And with the drought situation and having had off of the grazing burn, the cattle are busy dying on their feet. My head spins on the way back. But the next morning, there is the promise of rain in the air. 
It doesn't seem to help Cornelius, who is in a foul mood today. Yesterday, he found signs of two places where poachers had dragged their prey through the fence, and his game guards are in for it. Why didn't you come and report to me? Look here. Why? I saw him at the Saturday, mid house. What was it? A giraffe or an eland or what? It's a wild beast. Wild beast. I don't like it. I've got three game scouts here. Oh, a Waldevere scout, does he know? He's lying the bastard. He doesn't even know what it was. I get so angry when they do this to me. But we're not going to ask her. We're not going to answer patrol. Yeah, we're not going to be nearly because we're not going to patrol. We're going to store it when I'm going to patrol. Now we're going to. And it's like, we're going to have a hondo rapper, a rogue game rapper. We also stopped at another crawl. See, all the fences have been stripped here to use as wire snares. If we'd like to bring cattle back here, we'll have to rebuild everything from scratch. And do you know what that will cost us? You heard yesterday what the price of wire is. But here you can see for yourself, it used to be complete crowds. We worked here with cattle and now there is nothing, all because of them. It was the invention of PVC piping that opened this world up for farming. Look, Johan, this is how they destroy it. You see the pipes coming from the borehole to the tank and also to the dam. This is how they operate. And if they have to come and fix it here, do you know what it will cost them? Thousands of dollars and they won't do it, I know. We are suffering tremendous losses here. And that is why a lot of farmers have decided it's just not worth it. Let's pack up and go. But I can't do it. It's not in my nature. I can't explain it. To just let go and run, I can't do it. It doesn't work like that with me. I'll fight. The only person who can get me off this farm is my employer. He can say, I don't have work for you any longer. You'll have to go and then I'll go. But otherwise, I won't be intimidated by anybody. I'll push these blacks who keep worrying me. They can look for their own water. They can bloody well dig their own wells in the river and use buckets to give water for the animals. I'll appoint some more game scouts to help stop this. Then he takes me to the hunting base camp, built especially for the overseas hunters, but taken over by settlers before the first hunters arrived. The main building now serves as a school, without chairs or a blackboard. At first, they dug a well in a dry riverbed for water. Yeah, I gonna bother. Yeah, when I dig a romanzi. Jan is trying to dig and see if there's water left, but it's a losing battle. The earth isn't even damp anymore. Now the women have to use buckets at the camp well to get water for their families and their animals. the animals who suffer most around here. This donkey is also not going to make it. He's going to die. Except for the thirst and the lack of food, signs of abuse can be seen everywhere. can't help but wonder what lot awaits this young one. It is the first time I see the dogs responsible for so much of the destruction. The 
even though it is on their farm, it is too dangerous for Cornelius to do anything about them here. It seems that their owner has come to hunt. John, this man came through the river with these dogs. He doesn't live here. He lives on the other side. You see, Johan, they've taken the complete fence between the camps. There's nothing left here. Nothing. The destruction is terrible. Close to the camp, we stop at an old carcass. The snare was here like this. The noose was here and the branches kept it. The giraffe came through. It's not fresh, but you can still see it clearly. And then the dog. So the dogs, like all animals here, become victims of the human struggle. The poachers leave their mark everywhere. But before there is time for it to sink in properly, the dogs are barking yet again, somewhere deeper in the camp. It looks like a lost battle. This big giraffe bull walked unsuspectingly into the trap, and no one used the meat. Back home, there is news. Nero. Where's meat? Where's the meat? The poacher is brought closer, and an ass. Yon here is clear evidence. This is the axe with which they chopped up the giraffe. Here is the blood. It belongs to the other poacher who ran away. Right. I get so angry, I'll... I'll... Now he has to take us to the scene of the crime. It is swelteringly hot, and all we really have to do is follow the string. He says he used the string. But it was dogs. And there is eight dogs. See where the blood ran down its hind legs when they stabbed him. Do you see it? Yes, I see. I mean, it is the six dead giraffe that I see this week. Yes, if the dogs cornered him here, yeah, there was no escape. The giraffe's legs are evident. And as the police don't have transport, Cornelius has to take them the 40 kilometers there using his own diesel, even though the penalty is often so light that the poacher will probably be back on the farm tomorrow. This is the police station of Mwenezi. They'll have to do the paperwork. But I'm not supposed to be here, so my camera has to disappear. With the poacher for now behind bars, we have to rush off. It's almost time for the cattle auction to start. About 600 head of cattle have been bought here over days. Even with no feedlots anymore and with the cattle in poor condition, a lot of farmers still want to sell off their cattle, just to try and get at least something before the pressure caused by the settlers and the extra cattle 
exporters even more debt. The rates and the prices are the lowest in years, and there are not many buyers. The heat is tremendous, even in the shade of the old ebony trees, but everyone waits patiently. The area has been free of foot and mouth disease for years, but now settlers have moved their cattle here from contaminated areas. And then we get the news. A sore was found in one of the animals' mouths. And the auction has been cancelled. Even worse, all 570 animals have to be slaughtered immediately. Another telling blow for the farmers and the animals. The next morning, the day starts on the by now familiar note. More snares removed from the farm yesterday, and more meat for the laborers, compliments of the settlers. Then Cornelius rewards his vanguards with a bonus for catching the poacher. And then it is off to Locked Kraal. A whole group of settlers are waiting for us there. Cornelius' animals have been locked in all night and couldn't get to their grazing. The settlers' animals are dying of thirst and they don't have diesel. Everyone is difficult. The ticking of the time bomb is getting louder. I'm standing on the Land Rover's roof, not noticing that the settlers seem to look at me differently today. Matters seem to be getting out of hand where Cornelius is surrounded by the angry settlers. I jump off to go and help, but I'm suddenly grabbed from behind. Apparently, they don't like the color of my skin or my camera, and I'm pegged to the vehicle while Cornelius is being pushed and shoved around. I put my camera away and the emotion subsides. Cornelius goes home while I move on to another farm for an interview. But on my arrival there, I'm told that Cornelius phones. He has been locked into his house by the settlers, who are now looking for the foreign journalists. We all decide that it is getting a bit too dangerous now, not just for the farmers who have spoken on camera, but also for my own safety. It seems better for me to immediately return to South Africa. I hastily get my things together, but there's one small problem. All my precious and, of course, incriminating footage is in Cornelius' now surrounded house. But just then, while I'm still busy, he suddenly turns in through the gate. So you managed to get out of the house? Yes, Johan, they wanted to know where you are, so I said your Land Rover broke down. I'm taking the chain to go and tow you back. Did you get my footage? It's all in your bag. From now on, it's your job to hide them. I've done my bit. Because of the severe heat, the telephone system has gone down, and no one can warn the border post about my pending escape. As I finish packing, Cornelius still has a last comment. Johan Boeta. I will your ending for tell. Johan Boeta. I'd like to tell you one thing. Those people this morning want to tell me that 20 liters of diesel is enough to pump water for 180 head of cattle, 20 donkeys and a lot of goats for a month. That is how the argument started. In the end, they forced me, pushed me around, as you saw, and told me to take away my cattle because it is there, and I repeat, they say it is their farm. I'd like to say to our 50-50 viewers in South Africa, wake up. 
We are going through an incredibly difficult time over here and we could really do with some sort of help. I follow him for a while before he turns off, but for a long time afterwards, I can still hear his voice in my head. It is not easy. It is tough. Tough! Why am I still here? I don't know. It's just that I love the Mopani trees and I love the cattle and I love the game. That is all. On the other side of Bitebridge, a lot of people are in big trouble. It seems that the government there has declared war against its own citizens and they have nowhere to run to. On top of it all, a lot of them are South African citizens and I can't understand why our government is allowing this to happen. And all my phone calls to our Department of Foreign Affairs have been left unanswered. Even if it does make sense one day, by then it will probably be too late for thousands of animals and for people like Cornelius Greer.